you twelve though. Okay, well. They have still them every some year. good palms. Anyway, I know, sure. definitely, because so. palms are eternal. <laughs> That's what they say, anyways. So here we are in the eight hundred section of the library. I'm a big Dewey Decimal System guy myself. I don't know if you are too. Moderate. I know nothing. <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm a no, Dewey Decimal cool. enthusiast. I was a big 796 guy as a kid. Uh huh. A big 937 guy as a kid. He's still this my beating heart. A 362 away. guy. True crime. True crime. Oh no, okay, never, right. never, 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 cool. never. But 808 sort of uh, it's sort of a gray area for me. And we're here to find your favorite book. Okay, 808. I think it is right. I think we put it somewhere. Here. Yeah. Hey, there it there is. There it is. What do we got here, Matthew? We have a first edition of The Lice, or I think it's the first edition of The Lice, which was published in 1967, also the year of my birth. Same. Mm -hmm. And when all um, good people were born. And <laughs> I... Be born in 1965. This book, okay. as we'll talk about, made a huge impact on me as a writer, but it also was a big book when it, more importantly, it was a big book right. when it came out. Right. But for you um, personally, it made such a big impact that you wrote the intro to the 50th anniversary yes, edition. Yes, I actually happened to... Um, my publisher, Copper Canyon Press, which is up in Port Townsend, Woo! Washington, oh, is also them. publishes Merwin. Um, and so when they decided to do a reissue of, of The Lice, a 50th anniversary issue, they asked me to do the introduction, which I did. And so I wrote a few pages at the beginning of it, which was just so the coolest good. thing. I mean, given so the good. impact that book had on you, which we're going to talk more about when we sit down in a little bit later, what did that mean to you to write that intro? Um, it was amazing. It was probably a, it was a professional highlight. And I mean, I don't know. I, I, I never imagined anything like that when I started writing, that I would be asked to write the introduction for a book that changed my life. I mean, that's the kind of thing. Yeah, yeah that's sort of a pinnacle right there. Yeah. You yeah. know yeah. what else yeah. is kind of mind-blowing? Right. Is that in 1967, lots going on, but a poetry book was big. Big like deal, this book. Makes me feel excited, and I hope that can still happen. Does that still happen? Yes. Oh, definitely happens. I mean, there's lots of, I mean, I'm just the first idea that came into my head was Claudia Rankine's book, Citizen, oh, which is a huge yeah, yeah, yeah. deal. But there's yeah. lots, that's just the first thing that popped in my head. I mean, we can think of other examples. Yeah, I think poetry, we'll talk about it, but poetry does something that other forms Forms. of writing can't do and we need, which we need. You know what I like is just so much poetry. I know. Like you just can just like rub against all the poetry in the library <laughs> and there's so yeah. much of it. Yeah. You're, and you know. if you feel like it, you can read this book too, The Joy of Sex. It's like... The Joy of Writing Sex. <laughs> oh, The Joy of Writing Sex. Oh, I got confused. Writing. For that's people who are a little bit afraid of intimacy, the joy but not of writing too much. That's, that's a big difference. But it's so nice. <laughs> I like seeing all these, oh, Sandra Schofield. I, I just yeah. like seeing all the books. And you had mentioned before we started recording, Matthew, something you like to do mm -hmm. in the library. Well, I, do I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I love, I too, I too love OpenStax and I really miss when you go look for a book and then the, you see what's next to it and you get all interested. I mean, that's I like magic. So many things like that and did done research that way because of the Dewey Decimal System. It's actually yeah. designed. You know there's going to be a huge section of stuff. Right. I mean, it's designed with that idea interest. in mind. Yeah. That, that, that related things are kind of near each other. So, But also the titles of, of things that you see are so, I, mean, I, th I find the titles of books so intriguing and I, I like to, when I'm working on a poem, sometimes I like to just come in and look at the stacks and just, find a title that seems to somehow relate to what I'm writing or push Has that ever happened that you've found a pre-made title in the stacks? And like well, yeah, but I'll also sometimes fold the titles into the poem. Oh, you know, I'll be writing yeah, not as a title, but just as a phrase. It sort of just uses an engine to keep going. It's something that's exciting, feels intuitively related, but pushes me in a different direction. Yeah, all the time. I mean, I've done I that. love that. I love it. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, we're in for a good night because I am not a poetry guy, as you know, and, and it is a little bit like looking at a Rubik's Cube to me. So I'm really looking forward to learning a little bit more about poetry and learning a little bit more about Merwin and learning a little bit more about why this book spoke to you in such a way. Reading your intro, it was very clear that this was book beautiful. was a pivot in your life. Mm, it was. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to finding that. So why don't we get down there? All right. Head on down. All right. We'll talk Here about we go. it. All right. Okay. Let's do it. Thanks. All right. Uh, take it with you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Bring it okay. with you. We've each yes. got one. Yes. I, I, have, I have the 50th anniversary. I have the 50th. Oh, okay. The cool okay. intro. Okay. All right, well, let's get started. Uh, Matthew, welcome to the Grotto Pod. Thanks. I'm glad to it's be not back. your first time. You've been here before, but that time we talked mostly about you and your career. And I do want to touch on that a little bit, but more than that, we're here to talk about this book, The Lice, W.S. Merwin. Um, I thought maybe we could start with you recounting your first... Um, your first encounter with this book, uh, you, you wrote this, so Matthew wrote the 50th anniversary intro to The Lice 
which came out last year. And in it, he told of how he first encountered this book. And it's a really great story. So I think I want you to start by telling everyone how that happened. Yeah. Um, well, I was in graduate school at UMass Amherst. Um, so in Western Massachusetts, the MFA program there. And I, uh, you know, used to haunt used bookstores a lot as writers used to do. I don't know if people still do that or not, but I, I did. And um, I remember just sort of kind of trolling the bookstores looking for new things. And I just had this experience of wandering into this different bookstore that I don't usually go into, this sort of new age bookstore. Um, I, I have a very vivid memory of it. It's, I like the picture uh, of you going in there. Yeah, it was like an ape. Like suddenly like escaped from the zoo and was like, it's like, like, it's like, hold, like eating a candle or whatever. <laughs> but like, but uh, anyway, so, so, you know, there was, you know, I had a pretty small poetry section, but I noticed this one book called The Second Four Books of Poems, which seemed so mystical and weird to me. And I picked it up and just decided I was going to buy it. And it turned out that The Lice uh, was, was one of the one of those books it was a reissue of merwin's second four books of poems you know, mm -hmm. so an inauspicious a title poem. maybe i guess i mean you I, don't think it was like it the cool, title though. that drew you in i think it was the title that drew me yeah. it seems so mystical it's like a book of spells so know. you picked it up and you started reading it and what was the initial feeling you had uh well i talk about it in the introduction to the to the um volume but i you know I, the first book of the second four books, so Merwin's fifth book is uh, called *The Moving Target*, and I don't really actually remember that book very well. But the next book, the sixth book, is *The Lice*, and I just remember just being so blown away by the kind of ghosty weirdness of these poems that I never had read anything like that before. Of course, later on, I came to see that it's in a tradition of writing and. We were talking about that a little bit before when we... We talked about so much already, you guys. I know. We got to really try and like <laughs> revive... You really the... should mic up the green room. <laughs> yeah. No, we said a lot of cool stuff in the green room. Well, I liked one of the things that you say in the introduction, and you just said here that it was it sounded like a quest book, a kind of book you'd find on a quest, and this book did turn out to be kind of a quest for you. I mean, your life had changed. You've dedicated your life to poetry, and now you've written the 50th anniversary edition intro that's a pretty amazing circle yeah i mean it was incredible i never could have dreamed of that when i, when I first picked up the book it was not even have entered into yeah. my mind but i don't you know i mean it's like those that thing i don't again i don't know if people have this experience so much now maybe they do but it was a lot of my discovery of um literature at that point was in a context of not knowing anything about the person or the book or anything. And this, I think that's better. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how it can be replicated, but I think it was nice to just mm -hmm. pick up a book and not know anything except what I read on the back of it and what was going on. And I didn't, I couldn't, you know, Google the person or look at their website or See how many reach out to them and have. be like, I love your book, you know, can we be friends or really? There was like, not like, it's just, that was beyond, I mean, I'm sure many people know what I'm talking about, but that sort of, con that idea of like even having that kind of connection with authors was impossible to imagine. I mean, maybe you could write them a letter or something, I guess, but I, that. People did that. Well, so yeah. that's, that's interesting because I wrote in my notes, what was it that attracted you first? Was it the work or the person? Because Merwin as a person is pretty admirable in his own right. Did you find that out later? And once you did, did that change your opinion or confirm your opinion? I had no idea who he was. I didn't know anything about him. There was no, I don't think there's a picture on that a book. Um, there's a picture on this book, but there wasn't on on the second four books of poems, I don't think. Um, and if there was, I don't think it would have mattered to me very much. I mean, it was just some guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't know. I that, made, that meant nothing to me. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I... I uh, it was the work, and I was reading a lot. You know, I mean, when you're when you're trying to like learn to be a writer, you read a lot, and you just read everything you can get your hands on. You, it's indiscriminate in a way. You're just eating <laughs> eating everything that you can get your hands on, and so I didn't judge necessarily anything because I didn't I didn't have any context for it. And this person was just he wrote like um, like a go like a damaged ghost like from the future past i mean it was like it was uh, just yeah. completely like 
just cool. not like anything you've ever heard in your whole life. And it's just, it was, it was, you know, and I'm not the only person who's had this experience with this book. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that it was a famous book. I didn't know it was an important book. I didn't know anything. I mean, I really <laughs> literally did not know anything. And I think that was great. I think it was good. That's a good way to read. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool that it was just the power of what was on the page really that got to you. Um, I guess, though, I do want to know that as you learned more, how did that change your opinion of the book? You know, it, it turned out to be, what was the quote? I saw one of the indelible books about the Vietnam War. And yeah, and I didn't even know that, to be yeah. honest. I mean, I mean, it wasn't that hard to know because, because there's a couple of poems in the book that are obviously about the right. war. I mean, there's a book called, called The Asians Dying. And it's, uh, it's um, you know, I mean, obviously there's some, poem, and When the War is Over is a famous poem. For that. There's, there's poems that are obviously, and there's also poems about ecological matters. But I think if you had asked me after I read it when it was written, I don't think I would have been able to, I don't think I would have maybe exactly known the date. And we were talking about this a little mm-hmm. bit before too. It feels timeless. like, timeless. like timeless. most great books, it feels in some way timeless. But Although very much of its time too when you right. know things. So it's you know, both. But a lot of times, I mean, uh, uh, you quote Virginia Woolf, uh, is it every poet is our contemporary? The poet is always our contemporary. The poet is always our contemporary, which is so beautiful. Um, but usually, you know, you can really say, you read something and you think, oh, yeah, that's kind of the 50s or that, that's this feeling of the 19th century or there's something about Merwin that does feel out of time. Yeah. Yeah, I it's think cool. he has. Well, that's his whole thing. <clears throat> he lives... This book was... I mean, I didn't know this then and only came to know much later. I mean, he he... I don't know the exact circumstances of his life, but something happened. I think there was a divorce or or the end of a relationship or something. And he moved to this town in France, this rural community in France. And he has a house, which he still has today, which is there. And it's, it's in this region of France. It's not a very touristy place and it's not a very famous place. And he has this house there and he's actually written... Mm -hmm. Um, some great prose about this, the, um, the lost uplands is a book about Mm -hmm. this region, but anyway, but, but, but so, but for him, like he was there and it felt like the cycles, the cyclical nature of life there and the rural community and the farming and the seasons and the way thing, I mean, the way things moved and the way people moved things around through, you know, still mules still hauling carts or whatever those things were timeless mm-hmm. and i think that timelessness permeates these poems also you know and has permeated a lot of his poems and so it's it, it it is out of time in a way i mean it's 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 um you know which i think is also kind of ama- amazing experience well and have. it would have to be to have that impact on you if it, if it is an indelible book about the vietnam war you're looking at it in what 1997 I think that was 96, yeah. Yeah, 96. And for it to still have that kind of power to you, yeah, then it couldn't be something limited to that topic. Yeah, I mean, there are poems that are that are very specifically about that war, or other wars that I also am really interested in and care about a lot that just have a different impact on me. You know, mm-hmm. they're not. But this this is a different kind of book. This book feels archetypal. It feels symbolic. It feels beyond the personal. It totally it feels, does. It feels um, like about being human, it's about the border between life and death. It's about, you know, it's about consciousness. It's 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 very emotional in, in an idiosyncratic way. I mean, it's, it's a weird, amazing, singular book. You know? It's emotional in this kind of zen way where he's feeling emotion deeply, but it's been distilled. Yeah. Well, I think he's also pretty blasted in the book. I think there's a lot of, like, sorrow in the book there's a lot of fear of mortality there's a lot of loss in the book it's not like a lot of book about you know it's, there's not a lot of poems about like having really fun dinner parties with like your new friends <laughs> no. are there are there other poems like that not by merwin but like in sure the world? sure okay. yeah okay good all my all that. my poems about dinner parties um <laughs> I don't feel that's but true. You have read a ton. <laughs> I, I'm assu- I don't want to assume too much, but I'm assuming you've read a ton of poetry in your life. And I'm assuming you had already read quite a bit of poetry at this point. What was it? I mean, you, you're describing, I guess I can't say what was it that made it so powerful to you, but how was it so powerful to you? What was the, what was the, when you walked away from seeing this book, how did things change? Um, I think... I, there, there are several things. I mean, I think one thing is the um, clear mystery of the book. I think that's, it's very, it's a very mysterious book. I mean, we should probably at some point, not too far from now, actually try to get into some poems. I think yeah. that's a very but, good but, idea. But I mean, it's, 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 
it's a very mysterious, elusive book. You know, it's not like, oh, he's really talking about X, Y, or Z. It's just, you know, it's, but also it's really, really, really clear and grounded in it. The voice feels very present to me. And I think I was just like, oh, I want to do that. I want to write spooky, weird, cool poems that feel connected to human readers. I don't want to write stuff that's like just to show off or like just to mm -hmm. be smart or just to be, I mean, this, these poems aren't about being smart. Mm -hmm. They're about, I don't think, I mean, they're, they're written in very simple language. You know, a lot of the motifs in them, I hate that word motif. It sounds like an English, I sound like an English teacher, but like, but, Our but you know, teacher. but like, <laughs> I, you're right. I am. Uh, but like, but they're, you know, the objects in them are words in them just repeat. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of words that repeat. And so it accumulates the meaning of it, but, they're but it's, words. it's interesting to hear that it inspired you and didn't intimidate you. I was too dumb to be intimidated. I don't, I don't, I wasn't, I wasn't interested in being, I mean, I, I was looking for fellowship. Mm -hmm. You know, I was looking for community and I didn't care if the poets were old or and famous or, or my age or dead or alive. I didn't even know. I didn't know if Mormon was still alive or not. He was born in 1927. For all I knew, he was dead. Mm -hmm. And how would I know? Right, right. You know, was there just, was no just, Google. What? There, there was, was no, no Google. Google. No, I mean, I could have asked somebody, but I didn't. Why would I do that? I just like, I didn't, I, I, I honestly didn't know if he was alive or dead and didn't care. Why don't you like, read some? What? You read, read something. Some? Well, what do you want me to read? I want, well, I want, I'd, well, I'd like something from the lice. I mean, why don't you pick just, because like, oh, yeah. there might be people who don't, who don't know Merwin at all and certainly probably don't know this book necessarily and it would be nice to have a little Actually, sense of what we're yeah, talking about. Raise your hand if you need any Merwin biographical information or if we can skip over that. We're all... Oh. Laura needs some Merwin. Okay. <laughs> I did write some down because I needed some Merwin biographical information. It will be revealed as time goes on that I'm a poetry neophyte, and that's okay. Because um, <clears throat> Merwin is considered the greatest living American poet. He's won, he won Pulitzers in 1971 and 2009, making him sort of the San Antonio Spurs of Pulitzers. I, just, I throw that information <laughs> oh, to you. Okay. Uh, and he was the U.S. Poet Laure Laureate in 2010, National Book Award in 2005. But he also was important in that during, this, during the period of time that he wrote The Lice, he sort of, he took on the challenge of becoming an activist poet as well. I, you have a, can you read that um, the part of the intro? Well, I, I did want to say, uh, yeah. Summarize? First, that um, he says that he want, he was looking to create engaged poetry, but free of obligation. And mm. for me as a writer right now, I found that something I really want to think about because it's, you know, you don't want to be engaging in propaganda and at the same time you want to be engaged and be taking up the important issues of your time and the things that matter. Um, but uh, he says the Viet Vietnam War led many poets of my generation to try to use poetry to make something stop happening. That's interesting, right? Not to make something happening, which is an allusion to Auden, but to make something stop happening, which is the war. Yeah, the war. Um, that's something I think that still resonates right now, that's for sure. And I think he continued that sort of activism after that. He's a huge environmentalist. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember what the name, there was a documentary called Even Though, Even Though the Whole World is Burning, about his life that came out in 2014 that sort of shows him. He lives in Hawaii and has a huge, rare palm tree grove. And yeah, he, yeah, he, he, he basically about, preserves yeah. species of, of, of trees that, are, that would otherwise be extinct. And he, there's a, now an organization called the, Mer, the Merwin Conservancy, and his house is on it. And he, he actually lives in a town called Haiku, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, but but he, uh, he um, yeah, it's kind of in the, in the central part of Maui, if you've ever been to Maui, you know, so it's not like where the beaches are. But it's... Um, That's a really magical, mystical place, though. Yeah, it's amazing. And he, he uh, yeah, he's, yeah, so he's been that kind of activist, but not like a marching on the streets right, kind right. of activist necessarily, but like a... Yeah, and I think his work is in a certain kind of way extremely unfashionable. It's not identity-based. I mean, he's a white cisgendered man um, old. so he's not so he doesn't he isn't like you know he isn't you know he doesn't speak to the that set of concerns that's very present i think in our literature right now uh you know but i think his work is very you know uh it's full of resistance i'll read so i'll read yeah. two poems like one poem i mentioned earlier this thing about um him living in france and um, he, he, this, this poem, I think, 
sort of hat the landscape of it is is in that sort of rural French uh, space, that little town space. But it's also part of there's a, there's a lot of dream in this poem. Um, it's called the River of Bees. In a dream, I return to the River of Bees. Five orange trees by the bridge, and beside two mills, my house, into whose courtyard a blind man followed, the goats, and stood singing of what was older. Soon it will be fifteen years. He was old. He will have fallen into his eyes. I took my eyes a long way to the calendars, room after room, asking, how shall I live? One of the ends is made of streets. One man, processions carry through it empty bottles, their image of hope, it was offered to me by name. Once, once, and once, in the same city I was born, asking what shall I say? He will have fallen into his mouth. Men think they're better than grass. I return to his voice rising like a fork full of hay. He was old. He is not real. Nothing is real. Nor the noise of death drawing water. We are the echo of the future. On the door it says what to do to survive, but we were not born to survive, only to live. And this other poem is called Caesar, and it's we were talking about how this book is in the context of this political situation of the Vietnam War, and obviously a sense that a lot of people had that the government had you know, really abandoned their concerns and was sending their young to die and, and just it was a, just a complete dis catastrophe. And obviously I think we, there's a lot we can, you know, relate to about that feeling in relation to our government right now. It goes without saying. Um, so this, I read, when I was reading this poem today, I thought, oh, this sounds like it could have been written, you know, five minutes ago. It's called Caesar. My shoes are almost dead. And as I wait at the doors of ice, I hear the cry go up for him, Caesar, Caesar. But when I look out the window, I see only the flatlands and the slow vanishing of the windmills, the centuries draining the deep fields. Yet this is still my country. The thug on duty says, what would you change? He looks at his watch. He lifts emptiness out of the vases and holds it up to examine. So it is evening, with the rain starting to fall forever. One by one he calls night out of the teeth, and at last I take up my duty, wheeling the president past banks of flowers, past the feet of empty stairs, hoping he's dead. <laughs> That's ending. hardcore, you know? <laughs> yeah. like, That's like, that ending, I was like, ugh. You know, I remember it was like, Wow. Okay. All right. You can say <laughs> that. for that. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, that's like, but I, but you know, but Merwin, the thing about Merwin is like that, uh, the logic of this, he's always so committed to this logic of like, you know, uh, he looks at his watch, he lifts emptiness out of the vases and holds it up to examine. That's not like, that's not real life. You know, you're not going to like, see, you know, that's not something you'd see really. Or, or when he says, you know, one by one, he calls night out of the teeth. That's not like, that's a deeper kind of logic. You know, that's a deeper logic. And either you're in or you're out. You know, either you're going to be the bureaucrat of the imagination and be like, well, what does that mean? You know, it's not like I'm just saying, what does night really mean? Or you're just going to fall into it, you know, go for it. Let it wash over you. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a deeper feeling than letting it wash over me. I feel very implicated, <laughs> you know, in it. Like, I feel, I feel actually more, I feel more committed to that language than I do to most of the language I hear every day. I feel like most <sighs> of the language I hear every day does wash over me, and is, and 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 I feel I experience it with a kind of horror, of like, of of just like despair of me of of superficial meaninglessness. Why do, you, why do you think that is? Do you think that's because because of people are lying, and most of what they oh. say is banal and stupid, and 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 it's on social media or on the internet or, or or in the news or whatever. Most of most of the language we hear is oh god, I scared this poor kid out of here about this depressing <laughs> stuff about language. Now everything's gonna be okay, I promise. Uh, but but I just mean that that for me, most of the language I hear is at best. You know, accurate. Are you talking That's about? Are you talking about language you consume or language that you hear on the street? 
that you overhear or people talking to I mean, each I don't other. hear a lot of language on the street uh, over here. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't walk around just listening to conversations. I mean, that'd be great. But like, I don't, I don't hear, it's not like I, I just mean the news of the media and the news of like, okay. the news of like the, the, this, all this constant noise that surrounds us of like, of, 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 of information, which is 95% of it is just, is just banalities and, nonsense you know it's like repeated phrases it's almost it's almost you know that to me that was i mean i didn't want to be argumentative when you said that thing about washing over you but it's like that to me I feels like fine. it's washing over me like almost drowning me and then i read something like this and i feel a sharpness i feel an accuracy but that's that's know. the mystery of poetry right there's this sharpness and this accuracy but you can't pin down the meaning right and that's really beautiful. Yeah, it is. The meaning is in what it is. Exactly. The meaning is in that yeah. challenge to the ways that people usually say things. That's funny because, as I said, I'll be up front, most poetry is a mystery to me. Finding the meaning is a mystery. And when I figure it out, like we were reading um, on the anniversary of my death, I'll read, I'll go ahead. We'll yeah, read, read it. That's, yeah. About, that's probably the most, we were talking about this, that's probably the, the most famous, famous one. Yeah. Famous, famous one. one. It's well, one on the anniversary of my death. And 61. the cool thing was, 61, I read it and it made sense to me, which was awesome. In fact, I found it kind of chilling because it introduced ideas I had never thought about. And the important thing being, I understood that's what it was doing. <clears throat> Every year without knowing it, I have passed the day when the last fires will wave to me and the silence will set out, tireless traveler, like the beam of a lightless star. Then I will no longer find myself in life as in a strange garment, surprised at the earth and the love of one woman and the shamelessness of men, as today writing after three days of rain, hearing the wren sing and the, fa and the falling cease and bowing, not knowing to what. So I, I read the first line of that and said, whoa, I've never thought about every day, every year you pass the day of your death, right? Like you pass the anniversary of your death every year and I had never thought of that and now it kind of creeps me out, but... I'm, I was really excited that I got it mm -hmm. because it is, because poetic language can be, um, I don't want to say obscuring, but challenging to find the meaning, at least for me. I, I, I think that's what I mean when I say letting it wash over you is that I don't, at least the first time I read a poem, I don't find myself. You don't have to work that hard? No, I don't, I don't know what it means and I don't care. Like, I'm not really working to find the meaning, I don't think. We got a big time poet with us I know. Up here Tell on us stage. Let's do. ask him what he thinks. Who's reading it right, me or Larry? We want an answer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, part of the problem is with the words meaning and understand. I mean, that's a, that takes, a, that sort of begs the question in a way because meaning the way something makes meaning is different depending on what it's use you know what what genre it is or what 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 it's doing i mean the way that like a song lyric makes meaning is not the same as the way that like a, a you know an, a, a you know manual telling you how to put your coffee maker together makes meaning right you know so it's so it's like it's all language but it's not but it's does it's a i mean i guess one way maybe to think about it is that language is this super powerful incredibly complicated substance and it, it it does different things in different contexts and it can be very direct and communicative it's powerful you know in that way like i can give you precise directions of like how to get somewhere or how to do some very complicated thing you know using language but also it can also be used to access areas of the unconscious it can be used to it can be used to derange it can be used to 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 destabilize and 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 create emotional uh, reactions in people that are not predictable and you know it can be also used for that it's like you know i'm thinking the analogy i mean it's a crude analogy but maybe bridget you can tell me if you analogy. think that, I, that that it's that it's no but that it's like you know paint I was thinking about that when you were saying that. Things. Well, I, I mean, was also thinking... I know that you don't use house paint on canvases, although some people do, oh. but you can but you can paint a house mm -hmm. or you can paint a mailbox, but you can also paint, you know, a Van Gogh. You know, you can paint like Van Gogh could paint a Van Gogh. I can't paint a Van Gogh. Well, I was also thinking about paint and how much more 
like you can go to a different place than you can with language because the thing about language is it has a concreteness. To move past that is, I mean, that's the magic of poetry, right? That you take these very concrete things and you push it somehow past that into a place that is kind of mystical and that breaks open into not just a new meaning, but its completely own thing. I mean, this is the hard thing to explain to people, although I think people understand this on some intuitive level, is that words are repositories of historical memory. They're, 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 their meanings are determined by history. You know, when we use every, every word we use is a word that comes to us from having been used through many, many, many generations before us. And, and, it's, it's, and sometimes some words are very, very old, many, many thousands of years old. And they, what they mean has been determined by human life. And so when we use them, they, they have immense power and magic. They don't, when we say a word like knife, like that word has, has been through a lot. <laughs> and so I can mean, give me that knife and you know what I mean. But when I, when Merwin says that thing about the ghosts living in the faces of the knives, that's like a different, that meaning of that word knife suddenly connects to all the other things that knives have meant to people over, over their whole existence, human beings. And so that's the thing that poets are doing. They're accessing that, the bigger resonances of these, these of language beyond the merely functional, you know, and they, they, that that's, they're activating that meaning. You know, yeah, stuff. And I know it's like elusive and kind of hip dippy sounding, but it, it's true. That's why that's why lines of poetry can be so resonant for people and they can carry them moving. like moving beyond like even if they have not gleaned some sort of meaning out of it. Well, some sort of meaning they, they get out. They understand I mean I, but not I, some... I, I here's the thing. I if you look at this book, I challenge you to find a, a line in this book that is composed. I, I'm sure you understand every single word in this book. Mm -hmm. And if we looked at a line, you would understand the meaning of the line. You know, it's just that you might not understand why he's saying it. Well, and that like was how it be, connects, but you're not, but, but it's not like you don't understand what it means. That was gonna be my next you know? question. And, and I don't mean this in a, in, in a old guy in dead poet society making a graph way, but how do you know as a poet, if your poem has been successful? You don't know. I mean, if, you, if someone reads it, can you tell if they're getting out of it what you want them to get out of it? Does it matter? Um, I don't, that's not really the question. I, I don't, if I really want somebody to understand something I'm saying, I'm going to say it as clearly as possible. And I'm pretty sure I can do that. I'm like pretty good with language. Like I'm not worried that if I really need you to understand something that I can't, say it but if i want to make a poem that has an impact on you and like changes your life yeah maybe you want to take us somewhere i don't know i i just do the best i can and i try to make these things and i've i've been doing it for a long time and i hope what i do does that but i don't know if it does it or not and for some people it doesn't some people it doesn't you know it's like writing a song or like making a painting i don't i, don't, I can't say you know but it's not like i don't sit there and say like oh what i really wanted to communicate is that like death is scary Mm -hmm. And I really hope I got that idea across. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing interesting in, there's no, I, I mean, no ideas are interesting in, I mean, you picked out the one poem that has like kind of a cool idea. Yeah, yeah. But like most, there, most of the time in poetry, it's not like there's some big revelatory idea or something. It's like, well, and it's I, like. And I like that idea. It's like, you know, my favorite songs are the kind that take a two minute period and explore it really clearly, you know, or one little feeling and really take it apart. But you must have intent. When you're, when you're, I mean, I guess the hard part of me as, as a prose writer is you're like, I know what I'm editing toward. I may not get there, but I know what I'm trying to edit toward. When you're editing a poem, do you know what you're trying to edit toward? No, no, wow. it's not prose. I'm not writing prose. If I were writing, I, if I wanted to get an idea across, there was a specific idea that was important to me that I needed to communicate and would feel bad if people didn't understand exactly what I was saying, I probably would write prose. That's what? not, that's what, if I would like, you need to know that I, yeah, I don't know what, like, you know, <clears throat> think that, you know, Russia's 
you know, messing with our election system. Like, I'm not going to write a poem. I That's crazy. Even, like, I'm going to like explain it, you know, but like, but if I want to, if I'm writing a poem, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to reach for the unknown and I'm trying to reach for something. And I only know, I don't know what I'm writing towards. Do you ever write a poem where the intent is, I want the reader to feel this way? What, what do you mean? What way? Like, like I want the reader to understand that Let's take the most banal. I'm sad. Thing ever. Not even that. I want the reader to understand that this cherry Coke tastes fantastic. The cherry Coke is a fantastic thing. I mean, I don't, I don't, I mean, it seems I like deliberately kind of a most, small, yeah. uh, Casting? small <laughs> oh, don't. ambition for a poem. But like, but right. I mean, like, but I mean, like, I, well, yes and I, no. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I think if I wanted Pull somebody to understand that line, I would just say that. I cherry would just Coke say it's fantastic. You, but it, I have a poem in my in one of my books I where I say <laughs> that something a lot like that actually. Yep. And it, it, right? I was thinking of Frank O'Hara when he said that. You know, you think about having a coke with you. Yeah, having a coke with you. And it's like, but I mean, there but I there mean, are those whole Frank O'Hara poems where he's just like, I'm walking down the street and there's a, I don't know, the the girls are dancing and the hard hat guys are eating their sandwiches and. St. Bridget's okay, steeples. Okay, without getting too in the weeds. Like, yeah, no, like, let's get in right, the weeds. So I want it's weed. my, Weedy. Weeds? my anniversary's coming up. I'm married. Great. Um, I know. Shout great. out. That Shout explains out to the Sarah. anniversary. Okay. And I, I, you know, have been thinking that I would like to write a poem that in some way, you know, acknowledges that event, you know, for us. And that that, that so yes, I want to write a poem that in some ways authentic, Right. To the to the complexity and 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 intensity and 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 all the, the joy, all, joy of course joy. But and, I'm and guessing that you think like a prose writer and you think about scene like the specific things. Not I want to talk about love. But the point is, is like I mean I don't not like I'm not gonna like if I just wanted to say I love you or I'm glad we're right. mar still married or whatever, or like thank you for bearing our child or whatever, like I could just say that on a card. But if I want to write a poem, I'm, I'm trying to capture, not capture, I'm trying to grow into the, the, real, the, the strange realities of our actual relationship and I don't know what those are until I write, the, write it. Right. I don't know yet. And so, so it's dangerous work. Because you don't know what you're going to say. You don't know what's going to happen. It sounds like it's dangerous for the author as well, for the it poet. It is. It is dangerous. You don't it's know where it's going to go. Dangerous. Yeah. You don't know what you're going to say. You don't know what you're going to talk about. You don't know what you're going to discover when you're writing it. And the difference between prose and poetry is you don't, you don't say no to yourself in poetry. Or you shouldn't because if you're writing, if you're writing prose, you, know, you have a subject. You have to, like, st you know, you're like, well, that's not part of what I'm talking about or whatever. And you're not just going to. But with poetry, that's not true. Poetry, you can say anything, and you can go over here, and you can be talking okay. about one thing and the next thing. Can we talk about prose a little bit? Is that wrong, what I'm saying? Oh, no, I think it's totally right. It sounded like she was uh, You know everything. Wrong. Because, here's why. Sure. Um, here's my notes. Such a good prose writer. Yeah. And I that's think about you. You were angry about that. And, I, and it kind of pissed me off, <laughs> yeah, I told I Larry. I down, yeah. Because... And Merwin, also excellent prose writer. And I can think of a lot of poets who have written absolutely beautiful books that are not poetry. Why do you think, then, are poets such good prose writers? And why does it not go the other way? Um, I mean, I guess I could just say that, that, you know, writing prose is something that a lot of us have been doing our whole lives like you know maybe like just you have to write prose you know you mm -hmm. can't so so like i think it's like you know we've all had some exposure to that in a way like and so it's writing a poem is such a different thing muscle yeah and and it's entirely possible that you would mostly go through your whole life without even having any experience with that so so i don't know so i mean it's like it's kind of like um, yeah, that I think I think, that, I think that prose writers, I think that poets can often be really good prose writers. I true. feel like yeah. that. Not always, but, <clears throat> but what you just said sort of sheds some light. Alejandro, I hope you don't mind if I bring this up, but that Alejandro's wife is a poet who won't write poems because it's too hard. Well, that's not what he said. That's not what he said. <laughs> well, he, he said, said it took it her to a hard. place. He didn't say it was too hard, and we don't want to. We don't want to betray <laughs> it. No, he, I, I think I think it is. Uh, you need a certain kind of space to make poems that's very difficult to achieve in the in the in the hubbub of life. Like a headspace. 
headspace, physical space, time, commitment. And, you know, I think that it's, it is a different sort of consciousness. I think that's sort of more, I don't yeah, know, I, I don't know your wife at all. And I don't know what's, but, but sort of the impression I got was that like, you know, it does, t you do have to cultivate a different mentality yeah. and it takes, it's like, for me, it's a lot like um, exercising. Like you have to work out in a certain sense and you, and, and in the beginning it's very hard and painful. And then eventually after some period of time you get back into shape and you can do it again. And mm -hmm. I think it can be difficult. How, how do you with work out? Do you do it by writing children. poetry? Yeah. Yeah. You do it by write, but willing to write bad poems. Do you, do you have to get into the same physical space to write poetry? I think you've said you can write anywhere. Not necessarily. Some people do. Some people need, some people are very sensitive to their environment. They need to be in some kind of space or whatever. I mean, BQ and I, we were talking about how you need to have a certain kind of environment to do, to write prose. I mean, just, it just depends on the writer. I think some people are very, I'm, I'm uh, amenable. Like I can scribble pretty much anywhere. Um, when I first started at the Grotto and I would face, you know, the blank computer screen and be so stressed out and watch the hours tick by and get nothing done, I would think, Matthews or Pruder's over there writing poetry behind that door. If he can write poetry, Checking I can email. just like get some shit Checking down. Light, lighten and sense. I'm so glad that that unrealistic expectation. I don't. Me, 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 me. I mean, it really helped because I would think, you know, it's his job. He comes in here, writes some poems. I'm going to come in here and write whatever write I can poems, write. Get a little lunch. Yeah. 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 No, writing poems is different. Yeah. Another thing about writing, difference between writing poems and prose is that, you know, writing poems happens more, much more in bursts. Mm -hmm. And prose is a grind. I mean, it's grindy. It's a grind. Yeah. It's like tough. I feel like it's you, a um, grind. <laughs> I know uh, when you were on the podcast earlier, we talked about that you'd spent a lot of time in bands. Did you write songs? No. You didn't write songs. So have you Have you tried? I kind of, my songs are not very good. So interesting. Yeah. I've, written a, I've written like two, or th I've written probably three songs that are good, but mostly I don't. My songs are bad. I play music in a band with a guy who's an incredible songwriter. And so it's sort of like, oh yeah, that's a, that guy can write songs. See, I don't write songs that are that good. Every once so in a while, I would like give him a little tiny, tiny edit. Mm. I'd be like, a couple if lines. you just said that, no, just one. It was like, if you just change that one word, and he'd be like, that's better. But like that was Glad one time that. and like one record, you know, like one one word and one per record. Did you ever try in earnest to sit down and go, all right, I'm gonna write songs now? Uh not in a sustained way. I mean I've I've r i have i i can write music, but like I, I you know, I'm musical, but like I just don't write songs very it's interesting well. particularly with the a whole... lot of songs is we really need more songs like i like well, I mean, yeah, I yeah. like, like, I'm like, said, like because the whole bob dylan thing really brings up and the nobel prize brings up this whole yeah. thing with the the division between poetry and songwriting well division makes we talked about this last time in the podcast. i know but we did not, but it was so good we had to keep anyone going <laughs> no, I don't mind, no i wasn't saying that as a <laughs> criticism i was just remembering we yeah we did it. because yeah. i am kind of fascinated i mean i'm really of two minds of him winning honestly um and you said something like they're not the same and I was, I, and I was persuaded. Yeah, I mean, as I think I said, it's not the Nobel Prize for poetry; it's the Nobel Prize for literature. Mm. Ooh, Although in the citation they do talk about him as a poet, which yeah. I think is a mistake. But it's not the yeah. Nobel Prize for poetry. Yeah. If it were, then that'd be different. Then people are like, "Well, it's not," you know. Then we'd be having a different. That's argument. a really good point. I remember um, you saying that last I mean, time. Is, I is Bob Dylan not literature? I think that'd be a tough argument to make. It seems kind of square to say that i mean it's I we're mean, totally square i mean i think that is definitely literature i mean my songwriting oh, is i literature, love love Bob Dylan. Concerned. I mean, but there's so many great poets true true could have mm -hmm. given it to john ashbury i wouldn't have minded um, yeah I'm just, okay i didn't want to but he did not died at that point right i see what you're saying yeah yes let's return to merwin okay oh yeah yeah sure I want to know how the book has has continued to impact you since that one afternoon in 1996. I think it just. I think when I went, I went back to obviously when I had to write this introduction. Um, so the book and I are the same age. Um, mm. It was published in '67, and um, that's the year all good people were born. <laughs> yeah, it's a good year to be born. Okay. And uh, and. Um, so when I, a couple of years ago, whatever, a few years ago, when I was asked to do this, I obviously went back and reread the book and I was just struck by how much it had impacted my, the way I write. And I was like, wow, I didn't realize like how, how 
influential this book was. You know? So it wasn't a deal though where you had it and you were pulling it out now and then and taking a look at it? I probably hadn't read it in 10 years oh. at least, if not longer. Did you ever uh, find that you had actually sort of used a line from the lice or a resonance of a line or anything no. like that? No. I think that maybe there are certain, that we were talking earlier about how he repeats certain words in the book a lot. You know, mm -hmm. there are words like, I mean, I, I noticed that there's a, there, that he repeats the word darkness a lot, mm -hmm. and which is, happens to be a word that I like a lot also. So maybe it's possible that I, you know, was so struck by his use of that word that I have also used it in my work. But I never, I mean, also his, imagery is so original that I think if I stole any of it by accident, I think I would notice pretty right. quickly. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty striking. <clears throat> what about structure? Yeah. I mean, a lot, so these, the, we haven't mentioned, but this, these, none of the poems, well, actually one, only one of the poems in this book uses any punctuation and Merwin is, is known for not using punctuation. I really um, like not having punct yeah, punctuation. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. And okay. he says he let go of it because it made it it made he it made him feel like the poems were stapled to the page mm -hmm. um and i i have often in my poems used punctuation i i you know there's a lot of poems i've written but i also often don't use it and i think one of the reasons i don't use it is because i noticed in this book how letting go of punctuation um forced him to really just be so attentive to the micro movements of the poem, you know, like and be really, if you were, if you don't have punctuation as a help, you have to be so attentive to the way the words are moving. If you're not going to lose your reader, mm -hmm. you know? And so I like that. I like that pressure on my own poems a lot to not have punctuation. I also feel like it's a little meddlesome. I agree. Punctuation sometimes. I, I do think that's partly yeah. what gives it the timeless feeling too, yeah. is that punctuation can, can, speak of its time very much yeah, yeah totally. I, I was i feel like it kind of gives the reader a little bit of power too you know they're not being told when to stop and start yeah for sure for sure kind of cool yeah i think that's what he yeah i think that's what he meant about you know making the poems feel like they're stapled to the mm -hmm. page a little bit it's like they start to float off and then yeah. you can kind of like drift among the poems too but like you know but you can easily lose control of, of the poems if they don't have punctuation there's a reason why we have punctuation <laughs> it communicates information, yeah. tonal and, and and syntactical information. <clears throat> and so, if you let go of it, you're letting go of a pretty powerful aspect of language. So, like, if if you you have to be really good with the words mm -hmm. to not let things spin out of control, basically. You know, you're making poems sound like potentially dangerous, unruly things. They are. <laughs> they should the be. Page. They should be. They should be dangerous. They should be. They should be. They should mess with you. What about when we were when we were in the room earlier? We were talking. And I had to stop because I didn't want to get ourselves talked out before we got out here um, about uh, reading poetry on the page versus hearing it spoken. But I also want to talk about the way it looks on the page and the use of, of white space and, and organizing poems. Talk a little bit about what drives you to make those choices, mm -hmm. to make the choices for how it's going to look on the page. I mean, all these decisions are ultimately emotional decisions. They're 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 in this they're in the interest of creating an emotional effect in the imagined reader or listener. And so, when I do any make any kind of formal decision, I'm thinking somehow trying to intuit how it will feel like like how does a filled up page of words feel versus a very like spare thing. I mean, just take as an example, like if you okay. If you have a lot of, if you have a very formal structure, like let's say you have like tercets, you know, you have three li three lines, and then there's a break of three lines, a break of three, lines. it gives a sense of orderliness and control to the poem, and that the reader will perceive that, and and that that is a kind of thing that can be helpful for the poem or can be false, feeling in relation to the poem, and a, a sort of spread out thing all over the page with a lot of white space can feel kind of drifty in a way that can either feel really authentic to the thinking or manufactured and, and false. You know, it's like, it's just, you have to just find the form. I think that can, can, can it's almost like, uh, I mean, it's going to sound like a stupid analogy, but it's like um, people who dress in a way that's authentic to their personality versus people who don't, 
Mm. You know, it's almost like clothing form, although that's a bad analogy in a certain sense because it, it makes it feel like it's draped on top of something, which yeah. it isn't really. But then the way, in the sense that it's like some some de sartorial decisions can feel authentic and others can feel forced, managed, you know? And so like, I just don't, you know, I want the the formal decisions of my poems to feel authentic. So I, but it's trial and error. You don't know... And as you're making those decisions, it changes the poem, and then you find a different, you know, you're like kind of messing with things, and then something's going to change, you know, so it's very much like an interaction between the form and the, and what, you know, the, what's in the poem, I guess. And what about the question of poems being written to be read on a page versus being written to be heard out loud? Well, BQ, you were saying that you read, you like to read them to yourself. Yeah, I like to read poetry, but I like to read it out loud to myself. So, um, I can't think of that I almost ever read poetry when I'm not alone somewhere because I like to read it out loud. But that's interesting. So you just sit in a room reading it out loud? Uh-huh. And we're not here to I judge. mean, I get really I get really even <laughs> at my age, I get kind of swoony and excited when I read poetry out loud. Yeah. I mean, I can read Frank O'Hara, just someone we've mentioned, and still for that same stirring excitement that I felt when I was eighteen right. reading it. And um, reading these, you know, you do, it, it is almost like, I think I mentioned to you, it reminded me of um, Chinese poetry. Yeah. I don't know, you knew the exact era. Um, but it gives me that same feeling of being in this kind of in-between world, this floating world that yeah. I'm not quite sure where I am. And, um, it, and reading it out loud makes me feel more part of that. Yeah. I mean, it also sounds good. It yeah, sounds, it sounds good. really good. cool. I mean, is it meant to be read out loud, do you think, all poetry? Uh, well, I don't know. That's a big, yeah. that would be a big statement. I mean, oh, I think yeah. generally speaking, it seems that there's something about the sound of the words that is really important to poets. And so that having it read out loud, either literally read out loud or just having it sound in the head of the person in a kind of more material mm -hmm. way than prose might is, is pretty important. Yeah, I would say it's super important. Because the sound is part of the information of the words. Right. You want to uh, read some of your poetry? What? You want to read some of your poetry? Uh, I can, sure. What do you think? Yeah, we got time. Yeah, I would like it. Do you want to hear something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Don't you guys want to hear something? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I are, do. People are nodding. <laughs> <just> so. <laughs> I was sort of trying to think about poems that were, um, yeah, I don't know. I was looking at some new work and I was thinking, oh, are, are, are any of these poems like directly influenced by Merwin? And I don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but I mean, I can read just, you know, two or three or something, maybe three that like, and you can hear for yourself if you think that they sound Merwin-y to you, because now you you two at least are like big Merwin experts now. Yeah, so I've, read, yeah. I've read a Merwin book. Um, okay, so this, this first poem is called a uh, poem for doom. Doom, D-O-M-M, D-O-O-M. Oh, D -O -M -M. I was like, D-O-M-M. Doom, <laughs> poem for doom, D-O-O-M. Poem for doom. Birds don't lie, they're never lost. They never think above the earth, I stole this form, or blue is the best. I listen to it singing, my old man is far away, singing American songs, stolen from those who lived in what now is, but was not the park which makes me love him. I am eating an orange someone grabbed from nature. Over me, I hear controlled mechanical obsidian dragonflies search for anarchists. For a long time, I went to school in the palm of my life, carrying a stone, obeying the law of semblance. Now each night, I bring it back, down to the land asphodels cover. Then I wake and take my son out on the porch to say, hello, everything. Hello, green hills that slept. Hello, tree drawn on the side of a white truck, exorably rumbling towards some hole. Hello, magnolia, whose pink and white blossoms have left it, for where, oh, sweet doom, we are all going. Then behind us, we close the black door with the golden knob, and sit in the great chair, morning light through the shades, always makes look like a dream forest throne. All around our subjects, the shadow trees rise up, 
their private thoughts filling the room. I take them, like an animal with gentle, ungrateful ceremony from a leaf takes dew. Now, to me, like the middle of that poem where I talk about going to school in the palm of my life and carrying a stone, obeying the law of semblance, you know, and going back down to the underworld, that to me feels like, like some Merwin kind of Merwin. The first line did to me, too. Yeah. Maybe, yeah, that directness, weird directness. And the so. bird, I mean, there's and a lot of his hello, that start with everyone. the bird. But yeah. um, Poem for Doom, uh, I always think of you in those kinds of titles. Poem for Giants, I think you have. Yeah. And, um, I got sick of clever titles. I like it so much. Like it's like, so. But it sounded very, I mean, it sounded completely like your voice, but now that I've read Merwin this way, I really uh -oh. do hear it. <laughs> Maybe we should bury this podcast. <laughs> I, mean, only, I like uh, it. I don't think it's a big secret that I'm a Merwin. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of a lot of poets are Merwin. So I can read like a pretty new one. Um, I'm writing a lot that of That was beautiful, lately. by the way. I was, thanks. I, um, so do you all know Cordonices Park in the East Bay? It's in Berkeley. It's one of the Lori oldest. Does. It's one of the oldest parks in the in the in the in Berkeley. Yeah, and it was built during the WPA, so it's like there's all this extraneous stuff in it because they were just like trying to keep busy basically. Right. So, yeah. Make something. So so anyway, so my son loves that park because it has this tunnel underneath the road to go from the park to the Rose Garden. And there's it's also got a train like an old train, trolley train thing that they made there. So he's like in total heaven in this park. So <laughs> anyway, and he calls it he calls it Train Park and Tunnel Park. So the title of this poem is called Tunnel Park. Tunnel Park. I never read this poem. Nobody's ever seen this poem, by the way. So Tunnel world, Park. World premiere. World premiere, yeah. Excited. Tunnel Park. 80 years ago, during those famous dark times, when the government paid men to build bridges and dams, they carved this park my son loves out of a hill. The men needed to keep working to get paid, so they made a long, dangerous concrete slide. Kids screamed down, their parents watching with their hands over their mouths, then dug this unnecessary cool aperture full of obscure shadows through the hillside to the garden of famous roses I don't care about. And finally, some secret stairs. No matter how many times we've found always seemed like they were forever waiting only for us. My son and I went upward. His red shirt kept disappearing into the shadows. From pointless worry, I became tired. So we sat on one stone step and shared some blue water. Through the leaves, we could see a giant crumbling pastel house. It once was grand. Its dark windows still looked down on everything. It was so quiet, I could hear the message everyone knows. Worst times are coming. Who isn't afraid? Only the dead. We went further. The stairs never ended. We had to turn back to our lives, knowing there is mystery even in the new world. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why those poems, but just, you know, I mean, I think that merwin -y, like, the, I'm always trying to get to that space where the real world becomes mystical or symbolic or resonant or, you know, emblematic of things that we can all connect to. And I'm, I'm looking for that space. I don't just want to write out of my own experience. It's, I'm not a diarist. I'm not writing journals, mm -hmm. you know. But I also don't, also I'm very interested in the real world. You know, I like things. I like stuff that we all can recognize. So I like the permeability, you know, that I think is very present in this book of Merwin's, you know. Mm -hmm. and I, I think that one too had a little bit of that Merwin idea of, of the man-made world intruding on the natural world. Yeah. Yeah, or like the interaction of it and how they become yeah. like a kind of, echoes of each other almost like it's like this this yeah like the but yeah for sure like the the idea that there's this big 
natural world that's sort of out there like and then there's this these puny efforts of human beings to like you know do stuff and i mean merwin that's another thing we didn't mention is like this book is very and we talked a little about his environmental consciousness but there are these prototypical eco poems you know these mm -hmm. poems of mm -hmm. environmental despair in this book and that's you know 50 years right ahead of its time you know for sure I mean, that's a little depressing right super depressing yeah. yeah saw that coming yeah you know. yeah <laughs> Yeah. Although I, I do really like the line uh, in the poem you just read, um, where the roses are that I don't care about. Yeah. I like just like enough with I roses. I don't really actually. <laughs> I don't really care about it. I like, like that. Everyone's like, oh, that rose garden. I'm like, eh. I know. You see rose, one like, rose walk garden. around that rose garden seems a little boring to me. So, so, you know, what I can I say? I overrated. Form. I mean, I don't care if everybody else is into them. I just yeah. But your son loves that park. Yeah, but he doesn't care about the rose. He wants yeah. to he go through the, the tunnels. Tunnel. Well, I and can see stairs. that. Yeah. I, would, I like yeah. tunnels, too. Uh, tunnels, it's yeah. very cool. Tunnels really cool. I just think we should bring back the WPA. That's sure, like, absolutely. Put that out there. Of course. That's the hidden agenda of that poem. Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, we have about 15 minutes left. I wonder uh, Questions? if you guys would be interested in asking Matthew some questions about All of us poetry, questions. about Merwin. Anything. About anything. Yes. Matthew's book. Uh, oh, we have a mic, yeah. Oh, my God, it's Diana Cap, <laughs> my high school friend. I well, not in high school, my elementary. elementary school friend. Wow. That's crazy. He's Writer nice. Diana Cap. Totally crazy. Um, I was interested in the comment you made about this poem that you may write for Sarah for the, on the occasion of your anniversary and how you said you're just going to kind of wander into the poem and you're going to not, it's a little bit scary because you don't know what it is you're going to say. Mm -hmm. And I would think on the occasion of your anniversary, if you were going to write a poem for your wife, you actually would have something that you wanted to say. It's not necessarily that you want to say, I love you or thanks for having my child, but talk about how it is this kind of random bumbling into something versus... I have something I want to say, and I'm going to um, give you some sort of imagery for how it is. I'm going to express something I'm trying to say to you. Um, well, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe you're pointing to just a personality flaw of mine. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't know what I want. To, I mean, I mean, without getting too intimate. I mean, like there, there's everything. lots of times when I say things to my wife that are very specific about our relationship that are very positive and about, you know, like, but a poem to me is not the place to necessarily say those things alone. Like not only to say those things. I think it's, for me, it's a place to, to explore the deeper and maybe even hidden realities of our relationship in a way that's really honest and maybe that's a mistake <laughs> you know maybe i should just write not an anniversary well, it's thing. like maybe maybe that is yeah, not yeah. a good idea I mean, i'm being i'm laughing but it's like it could be a terrible idea actually because it but but i don't really think so because you know sarah knows me and she knows that's who i am and that's who she is and we you know our 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 we don't expect you know that are the way that we talk about these things would necessarily be simple or or or, or predictable, you know? I think and the so. point I'm asking is, is it something kind of unconscious? Is it something kind of unconscious? Yes, it is, it is. I mean, I, there are many things I know about my marriage that I could say, you know, that, and many wonderful things about my wife that I could tell you that would be true. But in a, I don't think the poem for me is not the place to like take those things and like turn them into images and just sort of restate them. That's not how I think about poetry. Like I, I, I don't not like, you know, my, my wife is brilliant and she's beautiful and she's professionally successful and she's a wonderful mother and she's all many, many, many great friend, many other things, you know, like, like I could say those things and kind of talk about them and come up with little images, little anecdotes, which would be fine. But that's not for me what I want to make a poem out of. I want to go deep as deeply as I can into my own experience of the marriage. And, you know, I mean, at, you know, you're married and you have kids. I mean, you know that there are these depths 
of actuality in your in your life that are all bare, almost beyond language you know but is and and you could say well why are you even bothering to try to put them in the language i mean i guess that's just my damage you know i want to do that like i want to do that with i want to make poems now other people might be satisfied to have those things remain wordless and i would respect that you know but i just can't leave it be you know i want i want to make a poem but when you wade into you know, does, that, does that make sense what i'm saying and it's probably and that's why i was laughing when i said maybe it's a bad idea but like it actually might be a bad idea you know that's what i was gonna ask when but you like, wait when you wade into this poem will you learn things so i've written this poem okay oh, and i'm not yeah. gonna read it right now yeah. but because i because she hasn't seen it but there's a lot of stuff in there that's very intimate and and not i don't mean intimate about our sex life or something i mean that <laughs> intimate but i mean about our lives that other people don't necessarily know, you know? And so publishing this poem will be, will expose us. And I don't mean in a bad way. It's not like, 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 oh, whatever. I don't, there's nothing dramatic. I don't mean that. I just mean like that it's about our lives and our son and our, our, our you know, and things that we've struck, gone through. You know, I'm just like, it's, it's heavy. And so it's, and so I don't know. I just, I just, that's what happened when I when I got real in the poem, and I think, um, you know, that's just what I go to poetry for, and I and I think it's, I don't know, I just I that that's that's the way that my poems come out. I can't like, do anything about it, you know. Um, I don't even know what I'm saying about that. No, it's anyway. a very complete answer. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. a... Any but other... I like that question. I think. I think it's a really great question because I think it gets to the heart of like what different impulses people might have for writing poems or anything else. Like, and there are different things that people want to do at different times with writing or with languages in general, I would say writing. And so, so I think that is a very perceptive question because it gets at like maybe what's central for me about that trouble, like wanting to trouble the waters, you know, through poems or something, you know. Like or get deeper into that, closer to that wordless space. So I'm I'm glad you asked that question. I have a much more banal question. Um, is there another poet or author that had an impact similar to Merwin on you, or others that you would? So many, so many. I mean, oh my God. I mean, we could go on, but um, one of the well. You know, we brought up the ninth century Tang Dynasty poets, Chinese poets earlier. Bridget BQ mentioned that. I mean, poets like Li Po and Du Fu and other poets in translation had a huge, you know, those those poets made a huge impact on me. My teacher, James Tate, John Ashbery, um, Elizabeth Bishop, you know, so many poets. I mean, like, I mean, I, I mean, it could go on and on. Yeah, there, there are probably 20 names, 20 to 30 names that were like, you know, really, but when you're, you know, when you're really deeply involved in a, trying to teach yourself how to be an artist, I think there, there, there are artists who can take you over for a little while and you become completely, complete disciples of them. And that lasts a certain period of time. And then you metabolize their, the information they have for you and then you move on. But there's always a kind of love that you retain for those artists. Yeah. Does that still happen to you? Do you still like Discover. Pick up, pick up a book of poetry, and are just like, wow. Yeah, for blown sure. away, fall in love. Mostly, it's dead poets. And it's <clears> not <throat> really. I mean, it's hard now to, you know, it's hard to write a really great book of poetry. I mean, that don't ha happen that often. But yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. There. Yeah, I mean, when I run into real poetry, I mean, I'm, I'm still become like a, a fan. You know, I'm a big fan. For sure, yeah. Best. Yeah, it is the best. It is the best to fall in love with something <clears throat> like that. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I'm trying and to think if there's anything new that I've run into that's done that to me. I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Do you ever run into any stu student poetry that really impresses you? All the time. My students are great poets. They don't, you know, it's hard to write a whole right. book. Like, you know, that, but, but, but yeah, I mean, for sure, almost always there's, you know, they'll write a couple things that are really good. And you're like, oh, that's really great. Like, you just have to do that a lot more. <laughs> but it's not, but I mean, it's not, but yeah, I mean, and a lot of time my students, 
are fresher and they're more they're mm. more their relationship to the poem is freer they they can have fewer preconceptions and and make really really interesting like i'm making air quotes now for the radio like mistakes which aren't really mistakes at all they're actually like brilliant right. things but that the, they did by accident or whatever oh no my god i mean my students are i mean it's it's horrible because some often I'll be sitting in class and I'll be like, God, that is so much better <laughs> than I've written the past month or whatever, you know? I'm like, I have to just try to, you know, pretend that I'm not. Are your like, students in MFA or Yeah, BA, I yeah. sometimes teach, I mean, I have people in the room, it's like, I sometimes teach summer courses that um, recently taught mm -hmm. at Napa Valley Writers Conference oh, yeah. and Squaw Valley and things like that. But yes, I teach in the MFA program at St. Mary's College of California, which is a great MFA program and with very strong students. Yeah, so you're really I teach with teaching. Brenda Hellman, so I get to yeah. work with really great poets and other and colleagues who are really amazing. And so, so yeah, I mean, it's, those poets, they're great. I mean, they're really good. You know, and again, I mean, it's tough to write a whole book. You know, it takes a lot of work to write a whole book. You know, you mm -hmm. got to kind of, there's a lot of trial and error and mistakes get made and stuff, but like, you know, for sure, there's a lot of good stuff happens. It's so good. It's cool. It's great. It's good. That's the best part of my job. Right here. Oh, we have one right here this and lady, one right there. Lady, yeah. Well, when you were talking about um, where you go in poetry, like what your the space that you're aiming for, um, I just wanted to stand up and say, yeah, but that's happening in fiction all the time. That where if you can precisely define it, it's really boring. Um, and I think as a fiction writer, what I'm interested in are sort of these echoes. Echoes literally of like how words, you know, the end of a paragraph sounds to the, the end of a paragraph sounds to the beginning of the next paragraph, but also like the echoes, the big echoes of characters and theme and all of that. And it seems to me that poetry <coughs> is also like that. So for me, it, it, there, you know, fiction. I don't know about nonfiction writing. You guys are more nonfiction writers. I think that we're going for the same thing. We just are taking a really super different road. Um, you know, one one road is pages and pages and pages of of lines of words, and the the shape on the page is not that imp is not relevant. Although I would argue that a shape of a paragraph could be relevant. But you know, and the other is is. Well, though that could, there you can break that rule too. I mean, break that whatever I'm saying too. But generally, I think of poetry as is more is more digestible, more quickly digestible, and also again, as I said, the shape on the page. So I just wondered, like, whether you would agree with that or disagree with that. Um. Um, I think one one thing I took from what you were saying is this idea that the ultimate goal of fiction and poetry is the same or similar, and that may be true if you want to talk about changing people's consciousnesses in their lives and making them feel things and 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 moving them and all those things. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, if, you know, but. I think that poetry and prose are pretty different in terms of their techniques and their their choices and like the micro choices that get made, but not always. I mean, there's similarities and sometimes they can get pretty close and all that stuff. So I mean, it's not. I'm not like so up here to like you know defend like the 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 you know the 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 singularity of poetry in relationship to prose or something. I just I just. You know, I'm interested in thinking about it in that way because I think it helps clarify some of the things that when we write, read poems so that we can have a different kind of experience with them. That's that's for more why I'm interested in it. I don't care ultimately, like, you may be right, you know, but like, I, you know, but I think that the problem is, without getting too deep in it, the problem is that people read poems like they're prose and they're not. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. And And people don't know how to read poetry really. Or they did, and then they forgot, or they were taught out of it, or they were given a lot of bad information or something. So it's like, that's sort of what I'm talking about when I talk about that aspect. Not, not to sort of say 
prose is banal and poetry is special or something. I don't, I don't, I, I read a lot of prose. I love prose. You write a lot of prose. Uh, Matthew's book, Why Poetry, out this month in paperback? Yeah, but I, yeah, but I also read a lot of fiction. I mean, I love fiction. I mean, I'm like a huge fan. I mean, like, so, so, so I, yeah, I didn't mean to denigrate prose. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually wanted to build on is, is poetry storytelling? Can be, yeah. There's lots of stories that get told in poems. Um, and, uh, and yeah, for sure. Um, but they don't have to be. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that there is an aspect of poetry that is, you know, often it moves from one place to another in a kind of way that's analogous to a story, you know, or it's, but it's not, but it can be more like philosophy or prayer or song or meditation or fragment or dream or fragments or whatever. So it's not, I don't think poetry is story. It's not because there's just too many other things that poems do. It's, down here? Um, I wanted to ask you, um, when did you know that you were a writer? And what kind of encouragement did you get? And how can parents and teachers encourage kids and students to be um, like writers and creators and not just readers and consumers? Well, thank you for your question. Um, I didn't know I was a writer until pretty late in, I mean, what doesn't Actually, doesn't seem like late in my life now, but like, what does the time, time seem yeah. like? The time <laughs> yeah, my twenties really is when I started writing. I mean, I always liked writing and thought I was a good writer, but I didn't start writing poetry really until my twenties. Um, I didn't get a lot of encouragement. Most of my early time of being a writer was was self taught. Not, I'm not complaining about that. I'm just saying it was like it happened kind of on my own. I wasn't like some star writer who won all the prizes and got I just I taught myself a lot of things and it took quite a while my first book was not published until my early 30s which now seems ancient which at the time was not ancient now seems ancient oh my god people are publishing books when they're so young oh i see yeah 30s, early 30s like babies i mean yeah, but but i think now if a poet's first book came out in their 30s it would seem yeah. late got it but uh, which it is not because nobody right. cares yeah. actually but like but, you know, anyway, um, and I don't know about yeah, encouraging care. kids. You know, I, I'm not really an educator of young children. I have a child who's three and a half, so I'm not really there yet. Um, I don't know. I just think kids are natural. I mean, whatever. This is going to be get ready for like a, a waterfall of banalities. But like, <laughs> but like kids are naturally creative. They're, they're, they're interested in making things. You don't have to get them. I mean, my kid just draws and scribble, you know, whatever. I mean, they're not, they don't need, they probably staying out of their way is a good idea and not telling them a lot of information about it and just being like, you know, I'm being really positive and celebratory or whatever is probably the best. I don't know. I'm not a child educator, but I'm guessing that that's not a bad thing, you know, but, but, uh, but yeah, and just not, not punishing them with a bunch of like rules and stuff about poetry is probably a good Don't idea, sign them up for a class. That's my advice. Don't sign don't them up for a class. I don't class. even know what they have poetry classes for kids. I'm sure they do. Um, <laughs> they sometimes. Just so wait. There man. are some great, I will say, just, just a little shout out to Kenneth Koch's books about poetry. Rose, Where'd You Get That Red um, is one of them. And that that's a book about teaching kids. He, he Kenneth Koch, the poet Kenneth Koch, mm. Koch, K-O-C-H, taught kids in uh, public schools in, I think, in New York. And, mm -hmm. and the, this book is sort of about his experiences and his writing exercises and all this. And that book is so great and full of like terrific exercises for like young kids and that are that are very generative and positive and and open things up a lot. And it's great. I always recommend that if anybody says to me, "Oh, I have like a seven year old kid who's like really in poetry or whatever," I'm like, "That book will not ruin their fun. You know, that book will help. You know, so that's yeah. excellent." That is excellent. Everyone's looking at me, which must mean we're out of time. I know. I'm oh. looking at you. <clears throat> we are out of time. Before we go, uh, Matthew, tell the assembled and listening at home audience your website, uh, oh. Twitter, all that stuff. Whatever that you want. Whatever you want. Tell them what you want them to know about how to reach you um, or witness yeah, you. Yeah, you can find my website. It's just my name, matthewzapruder.com. That so has all the information you need. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything else I need to say. I, just, <laughs> I mean, thank you for having me and for talking about thank poetry. You for for, uh, it's great to talk about so Merwin good. and it's great to talk with you all about, about Merwin and poetry. And thank you for everything. Say hi to him. <laughs> Fantastic. As for us here at the Grotto Pod, uh, you can email us at 
grottopod at gmail.com. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram at the grottopod. BQ, there's one more thing to say that you always say to end these shows. Why don't you say it now? I'm going to say it now, everybody. This is for kids and for everyone. Read, write, and just keep working. (laughs) Great. Thanks. Thank you. Bless you. Bless you. Yeah. (laughs)